It's about time we turned crystal to light and shone the rays of love. It's about time we tried to do what's right and find the sun above. It's about time we trained our hearts to fly. It's about time we soared to realms on high, illuminate each mind. Let us be the mirrors of the unseen world. May we free the colors of each shining pearl. May we find a language for mysteries untold. Let the silent cry of each heart. Send the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry like him. Welcome to Baha'i on Air. We are continuing our series of features on the Baha'i Arts and Spirituality Conference held in Rotorua. Our special guest is Australian actor Philip Hinton. Hello, I'm Maxine Salmanzade. Philip Hinton delighted audiences at the conference with his wonderful insights on his life and show business. Our Baha'i on Air crew caught up with Philip before the conference. We asked him about his work, his faith, his beliefs on poetry and theatre, and arts and spirituality. Philip, do you believe that there is good art and bad art? You know, we, all, we spend a lot of our time uh, in, the, in the world of arts. Uh, challenged as artists by what is good art and, and what, is, what is junk, what is trash. And in the world in which we live it's quite difficult to discern sometimes because there are immense pressures on artists, commercial pre pressures, propaganda, art has become advertising, um, and ho most of the product that comes out of Hollywood and you know m movie studios and other parts of the world is, 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 is trash, it's, it's an industry. Art is not an industry, and art should not be an industry. I resent the word, the, the arts industry. Now, arts is not, it, it should not be a factory to produce dollars. It should, it should be driven by something else. And that's perhaps the dividing line between uh, true art and, and, and art which is, is which purely created for commercial purposes. And again, I, I hesitate to sound you know, moralistic about this because sometimes the lines cross and I mean sometimes people will produce something quite startling with with purely commercial motives. It's never as simple as that and because artists have a living to, to earn and there are pressures on them to to, to earn their living in, a, in a, a commercially competitive field and so I mean one doesn't want to be kind of simplistic about this but I think there are moments when you can discern the true quality of art, which is sincere, and which often comes from the spiritual center of individuals. I mean, uh, not necessarily you know, actors. Actors are a, a little different in that they're not, they're not so much, they don't so much create works of art, although that's a difficult phrase as well, but they recreate. They're a bit like cuckoos. They take somebody else's work and they paint it in their own colors and portray, you know, a Hamlet or whatever. Um, uh, it's not an, as original as an original work, but as, a, as their interpretation of somebody's original works. Let us, Shakespeare says, ciphers to this great account, figures, numbers, parts, agents in this great account. Allow us, let us, work on your imaginary forces. Shakespeare, the towering genius, the master storyteller, appeals to his audience to join with him in a great adventure, the ultimate, the infinite voyage of the human imagination. And it reminds me always, that speech from Henry V, that the actor, singer or dancer and their audience, the musician and the listener, the painter and the viewer, or the writer, 
and their readers are all participants, partners, if you like, in that journey of the human spirit. And it has to be down a two-way street, that journey, since the wish, the desire of the artist is always to communicate his work to an audience, to others. And that, in turn, requires a willingness, an openness on the part of the recipient. I remember years ago hearing an interview with the jazz musician Miles Davis, and <clears throat> one of Miles' fans said to him, Ah, oh, you were playing so well last night, man. And Miles said, Oh, thank you very much, but maybe you were listening well, too. And I've never forgotten that. We, we have a, a, a mirror of the divine in us. And many, many great artists have told of their experience in creating their art as if it was almost revealed. Stravinsky, when he wrote uh, The Rite of Spring, Sacre du Printemps, um, said, I was the vessel through which the Sacre passed, as if he had received this uh, monumental work of genius from some other source, that he was actually just, just a channel which received this uh, glorious music, a most stunning piece of music. And this is, a, this is something which has fascinated me, and I think if one takes it to the absolute extreme, you can see art as a kind of spiritual voyage, and the artist as a spiritual voyager. And the search the artist undertakes is for God, for the beloved. Um, there's a, an, an entire canon of work which explores that theme. When I began to look into this question, I found um, a fascinating array of writings to support this idea, and much of it the experience of artists themselves in creating their works of art, that, that support the Baha'i quotation that all art is a gift from God. It's a, a very extraordinary statement that Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, makes. All art is a gift from God. Um, that is a humbling thought, extremely humbling thought, if you consider that, that the, the artistic uh, spark really resides in all of us. I don't believe that art is just something that can be made by a few people. Certainly others are more gifted than, than, than you know, some are more gifted than others. But, but I think the ability to make art and to appreciate art, that spark of art, certainly is in everyone. I'm also very interested in <clears throat> the process of change that's brought us to where we are. Let's reflect on this for a moment. The 20th century in which we live has redefined art. <clears throat> Sorry. Redefined art and the role of the artist in society as never before in human history. When you think about this, as little as 80 or 90 years ago, certainly before the First World War, it was still possible to speak about art in Western societies at any rate, with a capital A. Art was on a kind of pedestal. It was something to be aspired to, something almost sacred. But then something happened. The horrors of the 20th century went on public display through the new media of photography and moving pictures and Mankind's innocence was gone forever. Art now had to reflect life. The clearly defined cultural conventions and parameters within which artists worked in past centuries have been exploded in the last century and a half by a number of factors, one of which has been defined by the, the, the great British historian Arnold Toynbee as the annihilation of distance. Baha'u'llah predicted this change and stated quite categorically that it would of necessity be a painful and disruptive process. The signs of impending convulsions and chaos can now be clearly discerned, inasmuch as the prevailing order appears to be lamentably defective. Ere long will the old order be rolled up and a new one spread out in its stead. Baha'u'llah said to us quite clearly, these are not days of prosperity and triumph. The whole of mankind 
is in the grip of manifold ills. How can there be Baha'i art under such circumstances? We are just artists who are trying to be Baha'is or Baha'is who are trying to be artists. So I want to get that one out of the way right from the beginning. I uh, have a sort of uh, mixed background in the sense that I, I was actually born in Britain, went out to South Africa as a, a young child at the age of about four. So I was brought up in Cape Town, South Africa, in the middle of the worst years of the apartheid era. Um, I went to school in Cape Town, which is a, um, an interesting experience in lots of ways. Was, Cape Town itself was an interesting place to be. Um, and then at the age of about 20, just a few months short of my 21st birthday, I left to pursue my career in Britain and to attend the first um, World Congress of the Baha'i Faith in 1963, which was held at the Albert Hall. So there were two reasons for my exodus from, from South Africa. Um, and then I lived in Britain for about 12 years um, after that during which time I worked in some of the world's major theatre companies. I worked at uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company for three years. And um, this is one of the places which I learned my craft as an actor. I did two seasons with Sir John Clements's company at the Chichester Festival. Um, I worked in London with some very fine directors in musical comedy and also at the Hampstead Theatre Club and places like that. I did a short time at the Bristol Old Vic. So I had a very good, rich background um, learning my craft with some of the finest actors and directors in the world for about 12 years. I did a certain amount of television during that time, a little bit of radio. By that time I had a, um, a young family and I wanted my children to have a different experience of life. I wanted, a, I wanted us to, to move on and my wife and I decided the best thing would be to move to Australia. So we moved to Sydney in 1970. Four, late 1974. We've been there now 25 years working. I still work as an actor in Sydney. Nowadays mainly in television. But I also have my own solo projects which I'm working on um, mainly through the Baha'i communities which have toured the world and uh, several times made some tours to America and performed in South Africa and here in New Zealand a few times. What? Can I speak to you here? Yes. All right. Good afternoon, uh, dear Baha'i friend. My name is Howard Colby Ives. It's good to be here. <laughs> I'll come down to the Haraki room in about uh, oh, 10 minutes. I'm going to share my remembrances of the beloved master with some of the Baha'i friends. All right, I, I, I hope to see you there. Oh, but one thing, don't be late. <laughs> A few years ago, at the Pacific Horizons Baha'i Conference, held at the Altair Centre in Auckland, Philip moved hearts with his one-man play, Portals to Freedom. The play accounts the spiritual journey of Christian minister Howard Colby Ives and his many electrifying meetings with Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i Faith. These meetings took place in 1912 in America. I asked Abdul Baha one day, how is it possible for me, deep in the mass of weak and selfish humanity, ever to hope to attain to such high aims? And he said, it is to be accomplished little by little, little by little. And I thought to myself, I have all eternity to make this journey from self to God. The thing to do is to get started. We live in an age of transition, when the old institutions and traditions have not been yet replaced by anything that can be called a common frame of reference for humanity. These convulsions that Baha'u'llah spoke of were felt acutely by artists. And they express these in, in particularly in, in poetry. Poetry and music are the two that really come to mind for me. This is Yeats from a poem called The Second Coming, turning 
and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. So these world-shattering changes that artists have depicted over the past century and a half have continued unabated until our modern world today, particularly in the West, is characterized by, I think, two things. A newfound freedom to search unfettered for spiritual truth. And that, of course, you know, means freedom as well, freedom in all kinds of ways, freedom for artists to express themselves in a new way. But at the same time, by all that chaos and upheaval, and by a great universal decline of religious faith. Remember Baha'u'llah's words, the vitality of men's belief in God is dying out in every land. The corrosion of ungodliness is eating into the vitals of human society. Matthew Arnold, in his poem, Dover Beach, describes a scene standing on a shore looking across towards uh, the coast of France. And he says, and he likens <coughs> the, the idea of faith like a girdle enfolding the world. Listen to this. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round the earth's shore lay like a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar. Retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here, as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, while ignorant armies clash by night. The idea of inspiration fascinates me too. The, the Greeks, of course, the, the Greeks, the, the ancient Greeks, got a lot of things right. And one thing they believed was that, that um, God was within all of us. And they called it entheos, um, God within, from which our word enthusiasm comes. Um, so, and that the God spirit within you could create wonderful works of art and and new philosophies new sciences which accords completely with 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 the the, the writings of the baha'i faith exactly the same idea presents itself in a different form in baha'u'llah's teachings but all these works are inspired from realms above this idea of inspiration has been with us for thousands of years the greeks distilled the idea into what they called the muses Originally, there were a whole lot of muses, like goddesses, and you could call on your muse for inspiration. They eventually became three, and the three were meditation, memory, and song. The artist called upon meditation, the instinct perhaps, the, you know, the, that mysterious spiritual side of our being, memory, the mind, the experience of life and then poured that forth through the gift of song. Another way of describing this might be knowing and loving. The Baha'i writings tell us the very purpose of our existence is to know and love God. So perhaps here we're drawing a little closer to thinking of true art as an expression of that God spirit within. The fact that God is in the equation 
makes the whole affair immensely interesting because God is the all-knowing word we give to that, to all that is unknowable. And God is that big, huge love word we also give to explain the mystery that brought us into being. We don't know why we're here, we don't know how, but we know and love the mystery of it. We spend our lives, our civilizations, all our history of science and of art exploring this mystery. The artistic process is a mysterious and rewarding experience. This is the South African writer Andre Brink, a wonderful writer. And he, he describes his own experience like this. I open myself up to my own subconscious. That's why I write, to feel in touch with the whole of the self. All kinds of things keep surfacing all the time. You remember things you never knew before. Writing is a dialogue with the self and with the forces that shape the self. From the closest and most intimate personal relationships to the deepest social and cultural ones. In Hamlet's speech to the players, Shakespeare lays out in a few lines the purpose behind his drama as to hold as to a the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Now those words, to show virtue her own feature, strike me very deeply. They indicate that Shakespeare felt a compunction to express moral values in his theatre. Well, that's all very well for Shakespeare, living 400 years ago, when the moral boundaries were clearly defined. But how do we do it today? It's not so easy for artists today. Today, the moral landscape for artists is so confused that at times, the line between what is art and what is pornography or trash seems very blurred indeed. This is certainly a dilemma that we face as artists. There's even a school of artists producing what they call anti-art. I don't pretend to understand that, but there it is. The age of individualism in which we now live has brought new power and freedom for artists, but most of us have not yet learned to use that with discipline and restraint. I think Cole Porter put it very well. In olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking. Now heaven knows, anything goes. Good authors too, who once knew better words, now only use four-letter words writing prose. Anything goes. The world has gone mad today, and good's bad today, and black's white today, and day's night today. And most guys today that women prize today are just silly gigolos. You know that song? <laughs> yes, the world has certainly changed. Our generation has lived through and is still living through a period of revolution, perhaps far more, more far-reaching and dramatic than the Industrial Revolution, that mass media and technology revolution. And in the midst of this bombardment of media-based, commercially-driven arts that we all experience, one of the hardest things is to discern the gold from the dross. But the one that I feel most challenged by is the theatre of, of, of uh, literature. The theatre that comes out of Shakespeare, um, uh, the, great, the great writers like Chekhov, Ibsen, Strindberg, and, and on into modern writers, Athel Fugard, Harold Pinter, so many wonderful dramatists in this, in this century, um, that, uh, that challenge the mind. Uh, to, to a large degree, and uh, to, you know, um, pose questions about humanity and tell stories about our lives. Um, Fugard is a wonderful example of that. Um, in Fugard's plays, very often one of his characters will just, uh, character that I played, a character called Steve Daniels in, in a play by Fugard called A Lesson from Aloes. Suddenly, this man said, oh, I, I remember when I was a child I used to go fishing with my dad and we went onto the beach, and he tells this whole story about how he caught a fish. And it's captivating. And here you have a situation of one man on a stage telling a simple story about his childhood, 
about how they caught the fish and how they were so excited by this fish they caught and uh, you know it's graphically described it really is touching uh, and it tells you a great deal about that individual and I came to realize through performing uh, writers like Fugard that the most fascinating thing is when people tell their own stories um, I don't know if you remember a film some years ago called My Dinner with Andre which is two people at a table having dinner together telling stories about their lives just telling about themselves and to me that is always the most interesting thing on television is a, a documentary series there's one in Australia called Vox Populi where a very skillful interviewer will talk to people on the street and get them to talk about their lives what do you do how many children you have? why haven't you had children is this a choice all kinds of things the most interesting thing to any individual is another individual most interesting thing about about uh, uh, you know in life is other people and I I'm particularly uh, involved with theater that, that that touches hearts in that way and that um, somehow um, energizes the spiritual in people I'm, I'm very fascinated by by art and artists particularly uh, uh, theater artists who manage to touch our spirits our hearts in some way and who use their own spiritual capacity to to interpret and and to somehow explore the human mystery the, the great adventure of the human imagination um, at a recent conference in Sydney a, a Brazilian performer called Denise Stockless a, a very very great performer in her own right a, a wonderful a wonderful actor she said art should make people stronger and I was captivated by this remark it, it made a deep impression on me uh, I wrote, I wrote it down as I sat there in this conference art should make people stronger I'd like to think that 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 I I would I could work along those lines as an actor and perform pieces that somehow made people stronger you have been watching a special episode of the Arts and Spirituality Conference in Rotorua. In the next episode, we will continue with the second half of this program featuring Philip Hinton. For more information about the Baha'i Faith, please call 0800 Baha'is or 0800 224247. If you would like to write, please write to the Baha'i National Office, P.O. Box 21551 Henderson. I'm Maxine Salvanzade. Goodbye for now. The world has gone mad today and good's bad today And black's white today and day's night today And most guys today that women prize today are just silly gigolos You know that song? <laughs>